Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hello and welcome to Angel Investors and What Makes Them Tick. I am Eileen Villa from the Maricopa SBDC and I will be the facilitator for this webinar. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A so that they do not get lost in the chat. As everyone is joining us, would you please put your or introduce yourselves in the chat? And now we'll be having our SBDC counselor slash speaker, Lou Farina, give us an overview of the SBDC. All right, thank you, Eileen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome um, to our webinar this morning on a, uh, a rainy morning here in, at least in Phoenix. Um, thanks for being here. The, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go through this webinar today. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the SBDC and then we're gonna go into the webinar. But, um, there's a lot of information I'm gonna blast through here in the next hour and a half. We're gonna to try to leave some time at the end for Q&A. So as, as we go through this and you think about questions, put them in the Q&A, but we'll take them, we'll kind of take them at the end and I can stay on longer um, if, I, if we need to, to uh, address all of the questions. Um, also, because of some technical glitches with, um, with Zoom, Eileen is gonna be flipping my slides for me today. So um, please bear with us while we, while we coordinate. So again, um, I'm Lou Farina. I'm a business analyst here at the SBDC. Uh, I guess my, we call this specialization is in technology commercialization. And it's really about bringing technologies to, to business, uh, to a business and monetizing technology. Um, my background really is in corporate ventures, um, worked uh, around the globe, very, uh, very large projects, uh, different aspects with new, a lot of new ventures and some acquisitions, mergers, et cetera. Um, I, uh, I was an angel investor here when I left uh, corporate life. Um, I was a member of Arizona Tech Investors with known at ATI right now. Um, I actually review uh, proposals officially for the National Science Foundation for SBIRs. So um, again, I work primarily with uh, technology-based companies. And as we'll talk about during this um, uh, presentation, technology-based companies and angel investors kind of go hand in hand. Um, so next slide. Okay, so our commercial for the SBDC, for those of, of you who do not know who we are, we're part of America's SBDC's national network. Uh, SBDC is a national program. Um, there are programs, there's uh, uh, organizations in every state. Uh, we happen to be in Arizona. In Arizona, there's 10 different centers. We're in the Maricopa Center. Um, and so the, 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 my, one of my messages here is there's SBDC services, no fee services for you uh, in any state, there, in any geography. Here in, in Arizona, we've got, um, you know, Flagstaff and Sholo and Yuma, Prescott, et cetera. Um, so we're all over the place uh, with, um, with SBDC services. We do a lot of different things. Um, we have disaster loan assistance. And every time I put this slide up, I say, I'm going to change it because we did a lot of that, but that's not our primary uh, primary objective. We do a lot of lender readiness with SBA loans. We can do financial review, marketing assessments. You wanna buy or sell a business with some financing, manufacturing, technology commercialization. We have some specialty in export and international trade, and we have a special group doing just government contracting. So if you're at the point where you wanna do some government contracting, you think you're ready, talk to your SBDC counselor. We can put you in touch with our PTAC group. We do counseling. Um, uh, counseling is one-on-one -on -one, uh, um, uh, services that we provide to our clients. Uh, it's totally confidential. Uh, we work with clients through all stages of their businesses, and we work with many clients for many, many years. So um, th those are our most productive relationships, seeing guys through the, the growth process. Uh, we do training. This is called training. Uh, so webinars, we did workshops. Now we're doing webinars like the rest of the world. And hopefully we'll go back to workshops in 
in person with maybe some hybrid capability here in the near future. And then there's resources, there's tools uh, that we can provide to our clients. There's market research services that are no fee through us. There's um, some software uh, for business planning. Uh, let's say live, what we call a live plan, which is a, uh, a, a business planning uh, software platform for business plans with financials. Uh, we've got Profit Sense, which helps us do financial comparison. So we got a bunch of different things we can uh, utilize with our clients. So that's the SBDC. Um, next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about angel investors, and um, it's kind of a nebulous term for those of us who don't know what angel investors are. And honestly, when I came out of my corporate um, my corporate jobs. I did not really understand what an angel investor was. So I was trained here on the ground. Um, so today's the, the, the topics for today, we're gonna to talk about startup capital in general. Uh, and then we're gonna discuss in, uh, angels versus venture capital. Uh, we're gonna get into a little bit about what an angel investor is, a profile, who they are from a financial and demographic perspective. And then number four is really important, the ROI, the return expectations. Why are they investing their money and why do they expect so much, uh, such a high return on their money? Um, talk a little bit about some of the trends and dynamics that were kind of uh, precipitated by the, um, by the pandemic. Um, and it's kind of continuing today. It's, it's, I think it's very positive. And we'll talk specifically about angel groups and platforms. I'll give you names and show you some of the groups that are out there that are available. And then we'll talk about uh, some, just some resources that are available to you. So next slide. Okay, we're gonna do a poll. And the poll that Eileen is going to send out or show on the screen, has your company attempted to raise angel capital? So no, but we're thinking about it. We've pitched to angels. Um, we've submitted an application to an angel group. We've, we have commitment and are working through our deal terms or we've secured an angel investment. So this gives us an idea who, who, uh, who's out there and, and you know, at what level um, um, our audience has participated in angel financing. So we'll give it a minute here or so and then Eileen is gonna share the results with us. Eileen, how are we doing? Ah, okay. All right. We have a lot of uh, folks on the learning curve here, which is good because there's a lot of basic information here that will help you understand whether angel investment is the right path for you. We've got some folks um, who've actually pitched to angels. So that's good too. And I, I think it'll be beneficial. So. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a slide that I put up typically about, you know, who, wh what do people think angel investors are when they hear the term? Because the term isn't really descriptive, right? You just hear this term. And so the first thing on the left, uh, this, this one here, the, the angel, it's somebody who's gonna come down from heaven and just um, make my business succeed. Um, so it's just some, you know, it is, uh, it is a gift from God. It, well, not really. Um, moving to the right here, you see a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, a lot of folks saying, well, yeah, we, th th these, these folks are here to take advantage of us and you gotta be really, really, really careful. And well, that may be true to a certain, except being careful, they're not necessarily here to take advantage of you. They're actually here to work with you and to help you. Um, bottom left, a unicorn. A lot of folks saying, yeah, we know, we know these, these angel investors out there, but we've actually not seen one. Um, we, we, you know, where are they? Who are they? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, they do tend to hide in the background a little bit. And then on the bottom right, it's, hey, it's just going to be money from heaven. You know, not only if I, if, if I find myself an angel investor, money is going to rain down on me. And well, that's not necessarily true either. So next slide. We're going to talk just a little bit about the cap startup capital land. If 
fear early, right? You can take debt or you can take equity. Equity is ownership, debt is loan. Now there's, you could also take some grants, but uh, that can help seed you, but that's not really the basis for starting up a business. Next slide, please. So anybody who knows about uh, um, finding early stage, funding early stage companies, the first capital is the hardest, and there's really stiff competition for limited resources. So this is a very difficult and very challenging and competitive environment. Now you always hear stories about people who have um, easily raised money. They walked into a coffee shop with a, a laptop and there's a guy, guy or gal sitting next to him. And all of a sudden they walk out with $8 million for a, you know, a cat, um, you know, a cat bar or uh, uh, something of that, some of that nature. So there's all these stories. Well, the fact of the matter is, is really hard for most of us. But if you have raised money before and you've provided returns to investors with exits, so created value and had these investors um, provide, uh, provide value to them in a liquidity event where they're getting paid on a substantial return, Yes, it's going to be much easier for you to um, raise money on your reputation, but that's not the case for most of us. Next slide, please. So startup debt, let's just talk about, you know, you have always have an option for debt when you're starting a business. Um, and it's challenging for bank loan, for banks to loan a company that doesn't have a financial track record and challenging on being kind of kind. It's really, really difficult. And my my uh, my little slide here, my picture about the, the lender, right? This is a lender. And from an equity investor's perspective, this is a lender. You know, they got the belt and the suspenders, right? They are extremely risk averse, and there's a good reason for it. Um, you know, if you were to, you know, there are there are SBA loans that are available for startups. I'm not saying that they aren't, but they are um, they are hard to get, and. Um, um, so there are the 7A loans uh, for uh, short and long-term working capital. Uh, you can refinance business debt with it, purchase furniture, fixtures, et cetera. And then there's a 504 loan program for buildings or land and new facilities and some long-term capital like machinery or equipment. So as part of the SBDC, we work on these loans all the time. But the earlier the company is, uh, the harder it is to think about debt. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's just a very, just here's some math um, about risk return comparison. Let's talk about a bank loan versus an angel investor. So if let's say a bank lends you $100,000, uh, the return is let's say 6% interest. Well, that, I did this slide six months ago. It's more maybe 9% maybe nine interest now. Our interest rates are going up, um, but using 6% here. And the time frame is five years. And um, so what does the bank get back? The bank gets back their $100,000 in principal return, and then they get a profit or the interest over the term of the loan of about $16,000, 15,997. Now, if you look at an angel investor, I'm gonna put $100,000 into a, an early stage company, and um, I'm looking for about 10X investment at the minimum. Over five years, that means uh, what the angel investor will require is $100,000 back, but a profit of a million dollars. Okay, so what's the difference here? Sixteen thousand dollars on a hundred thousand versus a million dollars on a hundred thousand. It, it's all about risk. Angel investors need to be compensated for the risk that they're taking. Banks typically take much uh, a, a couple of order of magnitudes uh, of risk lower than uh, your typical angel investor. Next slide. Okay, so if you're if you are going for a loan, um, you know you're early. You're really early. What's the what are the decision factors for a loan? What's your experience? Do you, do you have cash down payment? How mature is your product? Do you have personal credit? What is your personal credit? Do you have any collateral uh, in the business? Probably not if you're early, right? But um, personally, do you have any collateral that they that the bank can um, use to secure the loan? How good is your business plan? Um, and then you know banks um, have portfolios just like investment and. Whatever they're they're investing at the time will dictate a lot of their um, you know their uh, desire to to uh, to um, to fund your business. 
uh, so industry sector appetite. Do they want IT? Are they looking for um, more things uh, with uh, early technology? What, what are they looking for in their portfolio? And it has to do a lot of times with what their portfolio already is. Next slide. So there's a progression. And Eileen, if you just click through the progression here, I'll, I'll talk to it just all the way through. Um, there's, there, you know, there's, there is a progression. It's not a hard and fast rules, but this is kind of the way it goes, right? So the, you know, the the it, we always joke, what's the first money into any idea or any business? It's yourself. You know, you got to put money in. You got to have skin in the game. Yeah, that's an overused term. And then I always joke about what's the second money in? Well, it's yourself. So you, the point is, you got to put money into the business that um, is proportional to your means that has you risk substantially risking your own finances on this particular business because if you don't um it, it's very hard to start a business uh, on other people's money per se um uh then you get into what you know these these um these terms on the top idea pre-seed seed startup early expansion later they're kind of arbitrary you know you've heard a round b round c round and that's typically reserved for venture capitalist, and then you have seed funding. And then, you know, what's seed funding? Well, venture capitalists can say really small deal is seed funding, but they may look at angels as seed funding, which is before them. So anyway, don't get caught up too much on the terminology. This, the order is kind of important. So, you know, after you've invested in yourself and you've, you know, you've, you've done your work, you start your business, um, financing options are friends and family. Um, there are some public sources that are available. Uh, let's say, you know, a good one here in Arizona is the AIC uh, Innovation Challenge, um, Arizona Innovation Challenge by the ACA. There's crowdfunding potentially. Um, uh, this We don't talk a lot about crowdfunding in this, in this uh, presentation, but that's a possibility. Um, accelerators, right? Accelerators will invest, inject cash if you run through their program um, and then, um, take out take an equity position um, with the with the intent of increasing your value at the next uh, funding round and there's grants and again grants not not really available there was a lot of free money available pandemic wise that was to kind of keep people afloat not a lot of money available to start your business except for sbirs in the technical field um, i've got another presentation on sbirs but that that's a good seed fund um, early taking on risk where others may not invest. So just be aware, SBIRs, look it up if you're interested. Then next, once you've kind of got these folks invested and you've been able to provide some sources, then you can kind of go to angel investors. That's kind of where they come in. And it's usually after the initial round and angel investors may call everything before then the seed round. Well, um, and then there's things called family offices. Family offices are offices set up by wealthy individuals that are looking for alternative investments. And then there are also strategic investors and, and family offices and strategic investors really can kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of come in anywhere here, usually before venture capital, um, but uh, they could actually come in earlier. Um, and then after that, potentially you're going for some institutional money and maybe, maybe you can talk to corporate ventures which are, uh, which are companies that actually have venture arms that will invest in things that are synergistic with their business per se. Um, and then, then you can kind of get to venture capital. So um, venture capital is way down the line with regard to starting your, your business for an early stage funding. Um, a lot of folks think they can start out and you know, I just need to find myself a venture capitalist, and everything is going to be good. We're going to talk a lot more about venture capital and how it how it fits into the big picture. So, next slide, please. Okay, by the numbers, uh, this I was at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of I kind of stole this from one of the one of the presenters, but I thought it was really just very interesting. You know, by the numbers, how many U.S. based VC funds are there? Is there's thirty seven there's twenty seven hundred VCs out there. How many organized angel groups? Eh, about 450. Um, you know, there's two, three, four here in Arizona. Not a lot. Uh, accredited investors, we'll talk about that. There's a, a benchmark that the government puts out on accredited investors and it allows some leeway with regard to SEC rules. There's 25,000 in the US. 
Those are typically angel investors or usually accredited investors, high net worth individuals, 8,000 ultra high net worth, I think over a billion 600 uh, pension funds, pension funds 600. Pension funds, we put that down here because they're usually the source funding for the, the, a lot of the source funding for the VCs. So this is kind of the universe. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, institutional or angel type investors. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about angel investor versus a venture capitalist and what the difference is. Because there are some very specific differences and it's really important to know, um, you know, especially when you're looking for early stage capital, who you're dealing with and what you're asking for. So next slide. Okay, so um, deal sizes versus transaction volume. So uh, angels, a typical check size is between $100,000 and $500,000. And it may be for an individual, maybe for an aggregate. Most of the time it's from an aggregate, which, you, which are, and we'll talk more about this, angels pooling their money together. VC, I mean, on the low end, $2 million. I mean, that's really low for a VC. Um, they typically minimum $5 million, all the way up to 50 to $100 million, depending on B and C rounds and who kind of comes in um, to fill out those rounds. So, um, okay, just big difference, right? Angels funded a lower level. Um, VCs fund at a higher level. They come after angels, but you got to be able to need $5 million, right? You can't just ask for $5 million. You have to have a requirement for $5 million. So if you talk about the number of companies, um, angels, while they're smaller in, in their investment, they fund way more companies, order magnitude more than, um, than VCs, 75,000 a year approximately. The number of VC transactions, maybe 3750. I don't know where this data was sourced for, but it's, you know, it runs, it runs in that order of magnitude on a, a per year basis. So next slide. Uh, angels are willing to invest across different industries. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to compare that to, to VC. So uh, this is an angel group. Uh, this is some data from one of the, um, one of the sources that follows angel groups is they, they, they will invest in a wide breadth of industries. And the reason why is because the groups are made up of a constituents from wide, a wide range of industries. So it's kind of a tapestry of different skills from different, um, uh, with different investors in the group. So that's, that's kind of the reason why they're comfortable because they may have some folks in that group that are comfortable in these particular uh, areas. Um, also, they're very, in, these are investable areas that provide the returns, the risk adjusted returns that they're looking for. Next slide. Okay, so VCs, on the other hand, have a higher degree of specialization. So um, individual firms can often concentrate on two to three different industries or sectors. They have deep expertise, and that's how they're, that's how they are, um, uh, that's how they approach their their investments and are able to um, assess the risk and return in their investments. And here's just I threw some four four out here, uh, just randomly and talks. You know, if you go to Kleiner Perkins, they like hard tech, enterprise software, healthcare. At least they did last year when I put this together. So you so if you're going to talk to a VC, you get to that final um, final uh, um, not final, but if you get to the point where you can actually a realistic realistically talk to a VC. Um, and you're, you're looking for them, you have to find people or VCs that are concentrating on your industry. So there's only 450 out there. So it's, it's an easier search. Next slide. Uh, structure and control, angels versus venture capitalists. So angels, you know, they typically like to hover around 20%, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. Most don't really want to... Um, to uh, have a lot of day-to-day -day control of your company. They'll take more of an advisory role. Although I, I've been involved in deals where the angels want a board seat, um, a voting board seat. So, but most of the time it's less control than a venture capital. Venture capitalists will take between 25 and 55% of your company, depending on the investment and the valuation. And a lot of times they want some operational voting power. So um, you're, if you do take VC money at some point, you think you want to take VC money at some point, uh, 
you're going to have some, we're going to use the term, but somebody else is going to be in your canoe. You're going to, you're going to have some folks to, to help you. And it's usually a good thing, but at that point, you got to, um, you got to, this is the, the point where you think about, you know, do I want to be rich or do I want to be king, right? V venture capitals can get you rich because they'll dilute you, but they'll increase, hopefully increase the, val the value of your company and you'll, you'll make a lot of money, um, but you may not be king at that point. So next, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little more about um, the profile of an angel investor. Um, who are they? Next up, next slide. Okay, so a lot of lot of uh, a lot of uh, text on this slide. So generally, an angel investor is a high net worth individual who provides early stage capital for startup businesses. So high net worth in parentheses. We'll talk about that. Um, and then here's some things about the SEC. The SEC talks about accredited investors. Most angel investors are accredited investors. They, they, they um, set a bar for these investors and um, you have to have a, a net worth of at least a million dollars, not including a private residence, annual income of two or an annual income of two or $300,000, depending if you're married. What, what the SEC is, is, is allowing these private investments um, without uh, some of the typical SEC rules that you would have for a stock for a disclosure rules and other rules that you'd have for maybe a stock purchase that you'd purchase on um, an open market. So what they're basically saying is, okay, we need, you know, we're going to allow folks who have the financial means and by financial means, we believe they have the sophistication to be able to understand the risk that they are taking. So this is the SEC's kind of definition of an accredited investor. Um, and you'll want to know that term as you raise money because it will dictate and I'm not going to get into this some legalities about raising from non accredited investors versus accredited investors. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of a high net worth individual. And I'm going to say this person is in their mid 50s, let's say. That's probably typical um, of an angel investor's age. Um, and if they had, a, they have a portfolio. Um, of investments, right? They're typically high net worth. So the net worth is their investments, right? And you have to have investments outside of your, of course, your primary residence. So what does your portfolio look like? Anybody who's done, um, uh, uh, had you know, the uh, benefit of going to a financial advisor talks about asset allocation. So let's say they've got a $5 million portfolio. Um, and how would they break that up? Well, the, the investor, an investor for a 55 year old individual of $5 million might say, I want 35% in foreign stocks, 40% in domestic stocks, 20% in bonds and 5% in alternatives. So 75% stocks, 20 in bonds, and then 5% in alternatives. Well, what are alternatives? Alternatives are riskier investments. They help, they help balance out the portfolio. Alternatives as we know them can be REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, they can be uh, investing in precious metals, could be commodities, um, oil, um, grain, corn, um, and it could be private equity or angel investing per se. So that's kind of where the where the angel investment um, piece piece uh, kind of comes into a high net worth individual's portfolio. The and here's the message here: like you know, if a, if a you know if, a, if somebody's got five million dollars. Um, to invest and they're putting 5% in alternatives and they're going to do some angel investing, you know, $25,000 or $50,000 as part of an aggregate investment is really not that, not that much to them. And so that's why they can kind of tolerate this risk. Now on the bottom right here corner, I've got this math that we're going to refer to later. So in the angel world, basically it's a portfolio uh, kind of approach um, and they say, well, you should really have 10 investments to spread your 10 angel investments at about $25,000 each at the minimum for $250,000. So if you're going to get an angel investing, you should, you should have about 250 to get in, um, and spread your, spread your investments out, um, 250 at the 5 million, that's about 5%. So that's kind of, that's kind of how the math works. Now, 
it doesn't mean every high net worth individual has $5 million. A lot of them have a lot more, a lot of them have a lot less, but I will tell you the smaller the portfolio, even though they might qualify as a, um, as an accredited investor, the, the more, the more important the angel investment becomes, the higher percentage of their portfolio becomes. And also the amount of focus they put on the investment, um, um, it becomes, it becomes more and they can, um, it, it may, it's harder sometimes for them to, um, to have a hands-off approach uh, with the investment. So we'll, we'll talk about that more a little bit later. So next slide, please. So what do angels want? And so what's their appetite, right? Here's a, I don't know if this guy's an angel investor, but he's got a big donut. Um, so what do we look at? We look at the management team first and foremost. What's their experience? Have they brought things to market before? Do they have that capability? If not, um, what are the, you know, what are the, um, the current uh, um, qualifications of the team? And do they have any plans to fill out, you know, some of the holes in the team? Is it scalable, right? Scalable means does it does it wrap? Can I rapidly can I rapidly uh, add um, uh, revenue with minimal investment? Capital efficient is another word for the other side of scalable. What's the most scalable thing that we've ever invented from an investment? Software, right? You write it once, sell it a million times. Scales almost infinitely. Um, so uh, what's the least scalable thing that we, uh, from a business perspective, services, you know, people hours don't scale very, very good, right? You have to, you know, a lot of hours, a lot of people to generate more revenue. So um, large market size is important. Do they have early traction? Um, do, have they identified their risks? Good to identify risks. Uh, there's risk, there's lots of risk in early stage investment. Um, angel investors are extremely comfortable with risk, but if you can't identify the risk and they have to identify the risk for you, uh, that generally is a, uh, that generally is a problem uh, with regard to investment. So you got to be, you have to understand your risks and think about how you're going to mitigate them. Um, do you have financial forecasts? Uh, how, what do your financials look like? A, every forecast is a forecast. Um, so it's got to be, and I was talking to one of my clients yesterday about it. it it's got to be defensible, but optimistic enough to be attractive. So um, I'll just stop there with that. And an exit plan. We're going to talk more about an exit plan, but exit plan means for an angel, and this is really important. I should have a slide that angels equal exit. Angels equal exit. Why? They want their money out. Okay. You got to have a plan to liquid for a liquidation plan, um, which is another investment coming in that will knock them out, or a, a liquidity event, an IPO possibly, but more likely an acquisition that provides an opportunity for them to um, to get their money out. So, next slide, please. Okay, so so angels come in different um, different flavors. You have individuals, and you have groups. Um, for the most part, uh, I advise my early stage clients to deal with the groups. However, if you're out networking and you're good, you might find angels who are out on their own. Most of the angels who are out on their own probably started in a group someplace, learned the ropes, or they were entrepreneurs themselves, um, and they have, they're comfortable enough with the environment, excuse me, with the environment to, um, to, to, uh, invest on their own. Um, groups, um, are, they form, they're, they usually form, I think they form as nonprofits, but they're, they're, um, they're multiple people in the groups. They usually aggregate their money. They usually have a website and a process, screening process. We'll talk more about that. Um, so, so there's both, you'll, you'll find both. How do you know if an individual is really a qualified angel investor? Well, it's hard to know. Right. There's there's you know, when you have in, the, the thing about individuals, you really, if, you know, unless you can ver validate them in a local ecosystem, which is possible if you're networking, like who is that person? Um, angel groups, you know, they screen for accredited investors and they have a requirement for investment. And so, you know, you're dealing with folks that do invest. So next slide, please. What are the investment vehicles? that you're likely to, they're likely to invest in. Well, okay, if we talk about Shark Tank, we see Shark Tank, that's a priced round. That's, 
common to preferred stock. I'm going to give you $500,000 for 20% of your company. It applies a certain valuation. Um, and that happens in, with angels. And matter of fact, angels really like to do priced rounds because they like to establish that valuation that they're, that they're investing in. Um, but there are a couple other vehicles that are used because maybe you're just too early to price or value your company. Um, and one is a safe, it's called the Simple Agreement for Future Equity. Uh, it's becoming more prevalent here in the US, in the US, in Arizona. Uh, and a matter of fact, I talked to some folks from the Midwest, they're finally starting to see it in the Midwest. It, it, uh, it uh, kind of uh, originated out in California out of the Silicon Valley at Y Combinator. I think they had the first safe out there. But what it is, is it is a warrant essentially for a future for future equity. So you invest, and then when there's a liquidity event, you actually um, are granted common stock based on that liquidity event, which is a priced round. So you're, you're really postponing the valuation um, until there's a priced round, which is you know another investor comes in, they establish a valuation, and then your money if I put $100,000 in and we say, all right, now it's worth a million dollars, I got 10% of the company. If it's worth 2 million, I got 5% um, of the company, et cetera. Okay, so right there, there's a problem. I don't know if you know, right? So if you kind of, it's subtle, but um, for the priced round, the higher the equity goes up, uh, the, the, the valuation go up, the more diluted you get as a safe investor. Well, that's not necessarily good. So they put some limits in there. Um, we call them caps. Um, on what that equity would, that valuation would be. So if you put a $2 million cap in there and you're, and you're investing you know, $100,000, it means I can't, I, can't, um, I can't own less than 5% because there's a cap. Okay, so the, the next vehicle is called a convertible note. And you see a lot of convertible notes here in Arizona and they're good. Um, they're a little more complicated because there's a debt component. Basically you're lending, it becomes a loan to the company until there's a priced round and then it can, the loan will convert to debt. Okay, so you got these loan terms to deal with. And so um, the paperwork for that's a little bit more um, involved and you probably need a lawyer to help you with that. But um, same principle, You're, you, you are, you are uh, postponing the valuation of the company until a future uh, event um, uh, or, and another investor comes in and actually prices that round. So next slide. Demographics, why don't you click all the way through. Okay, we're gonna put a lot of stuff on here. So uh, there's a study called the American Angel. It's a little dated right now, but it kind of gives you an idea who these folks are. Um, and again, this is, this. I'm, I'm giving you the data. Um, there's some commentary behind it. I'm gonna save that as to why we are where we are with regard to angel investors, but the gender, it's predominantly male. And I, and I say this because I, I, I want folks to know when they walk into a room, who's gonna be on the other side typically, right? Who are they likely to meet? Not right or wrong. This is just the way it is right now. Um, and uh, so predominantly male, uh, less female, older, older. You'll see the in the middle, angels by age, you know, most of them are over 51, right? So you got you got a lot of uh, angels over 51, even over 41 per se. Um, and then the race demographic, predominantly white right now. Um, uh, if you go to the coast and uh, in uh, California, you'll see a lot more Asian. This is on an aggregate scale across the United States. Um, but what, you're, what we're seeing is certainly a very strong trend towards inclusiveness. Um, and there's a lot of race and diversity initiatives in these angel groups. Now, these angel groups aren't necessarily governed by anything per se that forces them. But I think what we've realized uh, within these groups is, you know, diversity of thought is really important, right? We have people from all different backgrounds in industry and in maybe function. But now let's inject diversity in, in race and gender. Um, and that can help, you know, that diversity of thought, um, the increased diversity really um, helps us get better returns um, as well as eliminate any, any um, you know, start to eliminate any uh, maybe unconscious bias that are, that are, that are in the, uh, in the could, could reside in the group. So next slide, please. 
Okay. So, you know, if you're going to talk to angels, what do they expect? Have you, you know, start, you know, well, where do you start? Okay. We'll talk about documents next. So have your documents ready. I'll talk about documents on the next slide. You can contact the local angel groups, attend startup conferences, pitch accelerators, startup networking events, go to where the people are, right? You don't know who's standing next to you. You don't know who you're going to meet. This is, this is the place where you'll, you'll, You'll find you'll meet a lot of people, um, but you'll start to meet um, uh, folks that are, uh, you know, that could be potential investors as well as other key networking contacts. So it's important. Next slide. And what are the docs that you're going to need? And I'm not going to go through this in, in detail. Very important to have a single page executive summary. Um, there's a format for this, a pretty standard format. Um, a pitch deck and an investor deck pitch deck probably is not the difference. The big difference there is there's no ask in a pitch deck. Pitch deck just tells me about, you know, the problem, how it's solved, the solution, you know, the competitors, the market, et cetera. The investor deck will have something in there in addition to the pitch deck about the ask um, as well as some of the financials behind it. Um, you're going to need a detailed financial forecast. And then I put business plan in italics because you know, less and less folks are writing business plans. However, I will tell you as an SBDC counselor, um, the way to really um, create some good content for your executive summary, your pitch deck, your investor deck to get your thoughts together is to go through the exercise of writing a business plan. Um, so it's, you know, uh, I know some of the uh, investment groups here in Arizona do require a business plan uh, for some of the angel groups. Um, do they read it? Probably not. But what I used to do, and I was on a screening committee, we, I'd look at the, all the other documents and I'd go through, I'd thumb through the business plan to see if it matches, right? To see if there's consistency across the different docs. Um, so that was important. Or if I needed some more depth on something, I would page to it. But would I read it cover to cover? No. As an SBDC advisor, do I read them cover to cover? Yes, uh, for my clients. And I provide feedback. So next slide, please. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about return on investment. This is a big topic. Um, and there's some math here I'm going to try to go through. You're going to get these slides uh, at the end. And um, of course, we're available for questions at the end as well, as well as follow up. But um, the return uh, and the risk adjusted return is a really a big issue. And, you know, a lot of early stage companies balk when, you know, angels are asking them for 10 or 30 X return on their money. There's a reason why. Um, next slide, please. So why are angels really selective? Again, selective means why, why do they only invest in certain um, companies that will provide returns? Well, this is a, I can't stress, this is a very high risky, uh, very high risk asset class, extremely high. It's in those alternatives, right? Um, most startups lose money, right? This is, this is, uh, this is very much um, trying to find the, the home run um, in, in a pool of, in a, in a portfolio. All the, less than 10% of the startups provide all of the upside returns for a given portfolio. So if you had 10, one is going to provide the majority of, of your returns for portfolio. Um, all investments are screened for 10 to 30 X if you're an angel investor, right? So um, even though one or 10 lose money, you got to remember those one out of the 10, I'm sorry, nine out of 10 lose money. Those nine out of the 10 were initially screened from a large pool of investments and they all thought that we could get, that they could return 10 to 30 X. So these are high quality investments, even the high quality uh, investments uh, in companies, um, you know, fail on, a, on the majority of the, of the time. So that's why uh, angels need to recover on, on one. Um, on the right here is, is some data. Uh, it talks a little bit about five year return of individual, individual angel investments. So, you know, a lot of, in this particular study is called the World Bank study. It's an old study, but uh, you know, um, 35% went out of business, one and 1%, 17% uh, one, uh, got their money back. Um, there was about 34% that got one to five X, but the majority small 
minority of the investments provide the, the five to 10 X and the 10 to 30 X um, returns on their money. And the 10 to 30 X is only 2%. So that's the distribution. And I'm gonna show you some more math that better demonstrates what this pie chart is telling you. So next slide, please. Okay, yeah, here's the math. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this one or 10, these one in 10 investments that need to result in a home run. What, what does that really look like? So assume I've got 10 equal investments of $25,000, okay? And remember early on, I said, we're gonna come back to this. This is like the $5 million portfolio that wants to invest in, um, in uh, alternative and, all, and they want angel investments. I said, well, they probably need 250 to balance out their portfolio. That's where it comes from. Um, so if you had a total of 250K, which is 10 times 25K, um, you would get a return based on the math on the left, which I'll take you through of 3.3X given what's happening with this portfolio, which is really a 27% rate of return over five years. So that's your portfolio return. Um, that's pretty high, but it's not, you know, it's not 30X, right? It's 27% year over year for five years. Now, um, you know, uh, at the beginning, until the beginning of this year, you know, the last three or four years, and if you're in the market, in the general market, the, the Dow or the, even the S&P, you're getting, you know, 11, 13, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14% year over year. Um, by just holding the market. So 27% is higher than that. It's not a whole lot higher. But um, my point here is it's not a huge return for an, uh, for what the what the initial um, object screening objectives are. Um, oh, I had the average stock market here. I'm reading I'm reading my slide. 10 years is 13.9% for those nine nine or 10 years. So anyway. On the left here, the, 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 this is how we get the 3.3x. So 10 companies, the first five companies I put $25,000 into, I get nothing back. They go out of business. And um, so the next two companies, number six and seven, I put $25,000 into it. I get, I get one time my money back. I get my money back. There's an exit, there's a liquidity event. I just don't make any money. I just get my money back. And maybe there's a couple here that, um, and again, this got kind of, um, that I get three X on eight and nine. Okay. And so maybe I get $75,000 back. Um, and then there's one, uh, number 10, that, that's my home run. I get 25 X on that. Now, if I add those all together, I put 250 in. If I add my returns all together, I get 825 back. That's my 3.3 X on my money. And that's what is the math that converts to the 27% rate of return over five years for this given portfolio of 10 companies. Okay, so that's kind of the math behind um, uh, why angels require um, or screening at least for you know 10 to 30 X for a return. Next slide. So here's just the basic example of a 25x home run. What would that really look like? So pre-money valuation. Let's say, uh, you know, I go, you know, they're out for investment, and the, we say, okay, the, the company's worth 1.5 million dollars today. Company raises 500 thousand dollars. They get an investor. Um, that would be for 25 percent of the company because 500 thousand dollars added to the pre-money valuation. Remember, pre-money is before the investment. If I add the investment to the pre-money, I have to add them together to get what the post-money. So hopefully, if I add $500,000 to a company that's worth $1.5 million, I get at least $2 million in valuation. I mean, you don't get it, but that's how you do the math. So it's $2 million in, in, um, in post-money valuation. So um, no further investment. Um, or dilution of investors. Let's just keep it simple. So let's say I'm selling in five years, I sell this company for $50 million. The firm was worth $2 million. And now it's worth $50 million. There's your 25X return. The, the individual who had 25% of the, gets 25% because they own 25% of the company of the $50 million gets $12.5 million back 
an initial investment of $500,000, and that's where you get your 25X. So that's just a very basic example of how the pre-money, post-money exit works with regard to an angel investment. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is getting a little dated, but you know, we're talking about what can you expect for an early stage company who's, you know, who's made had some traction, who ticks a lot of the boxes. What's their valuation for their first raise for angels? And you know, um, the median is about four million. You know, um, a lot, most of it's between two and a half and four and a half million. Um, some of it's below, uh, under two and a half million. Some of it's above. 8 million, 8 million or greater, 7%. So this just gives you an idea of, you know, if you, if you check a lot of the boxes, what your company could be worth. Now, this is an aggregate. I will tell you, it's a lot like real estate companies who are raising money in Silicon Valley tend to, um, there's more money there. They tend to have higher valuations than companies that are raising money in Mississippi, where there's less money there. So the valuation of a similar company could vary greatly depending on where you are. But this is kind of, these are kind of the parameters that we work with. This is kind of what we see. Like a lot of clients that come and they have some intellectual property, they got a proof of concept and a business plan. They say, this is worth $20 million. You know, and I said, well, how do you know that? Well, I just, I believe it's worth $20 million. Well, go back to some of the data um, and you can kind of calibrate where you, um, what you think your company's worth versus what companies are actually selling for per se in these early rounds. So next slide, please. So again, this exit, right? Angels equal exit. Exit is an exit strategy, exit strategy for the money, not for the starters, founders. A lot of folks think this exit is how do the founders get out? Well, the founders stay in. The exit is the money coming out. Um, the invest exits what gives the investors their return. And when you're creating a story for angels, having a a well thought through exit strategy. Who are the likely acquirers and why? Now I'm going to tell you if you're in the med tech space, right, and you're and you're creating a medical device, um, you know you know who these acquirers are, who's buying the med tech companies right, in the big conglomerates, the Johnson and Johnsons, etc. Um, who are the recent where are the recent ex exits and information about how the companies were exited and the value. So if, if there are companies and you, there's some databases out there, uh, Crunchbase, et cetera, that can give you some um, information on exits and valuations. And if you can show, you know, hey, you know, a similar company or similar technology was bought by this um, uh, third party company at uh, this is the multiple or the return on, on sales. And you can kind of, Def, you know, kind of draw a parallel to what you're doing. So now, now you've done some homework. Now you can kind of get the investor. And the investor may not agree with it, but at least you've done, you know that you need an exit strategy. You know that you need comps. And, and um, then you guys can work together typically on, um, on, uh, on what that exit strategy would be if there's an investment. So very important to have thought about exit strategy. Next slide, please. Um, you know, just one one thing about just um, angel investors for strategic investors. Um, so, I, you know, I talked a lot about angel investors so far, right? They're interested in cash on cash return on investment, five-year time horizon and an exit plan. I want, you know, as an investor, I want some liquidity. I want it in. I want it to grow and I want to get it, be able to get it out. Very key for angel investors. Now, if you had a strategic investor who's maybe an investor in a business, um, in your business, it may not, you may not be a high tech investor, you may not be an angel investor, but there are investors that invest in businesses. And they may be more interested in returning, you know, in their returns as a share of the profits, they may take a much longer time horizon. Um, there may be um, some licensing ar arrangements, some collaborative arrangements with that, maybe their existing business, maybe there's some synergy between the two businesses. Uh, could be a supplier, maybe it's a customer, maybe it's somewhere in the supply chain and there's some value in, in, in um, working together. So there are strategic investors who don't necessarily have this um, very uh, stringent uh, need for liquidity and um, high returns, right? So they're more your, your baseline investors. And that's not something I necessarily deal with um, with regard to tech companies, but a lot of our 
clients here at the SBDC who are evaluating, um, you know, um, a debt acquisition may look at a strategic investor um, at some point. So next slide, please. Okay, trends and dynamics. So we're getting kind of to the end here and I'm actually doing pretty good on time. So this is some of the things that have happened here over the last two, three years by the pandemic and um, not necessarily pandemic related, but kind of how we're working today and how we are gonna to continue to work in the future. So, so uh, next slide, please. So this thing is spatial diversity, right? So it's just a fancy way of saying people are lo people are now lo used to working, um, not necessarily with people in their same geography, right? We've we figured out um, how to work, and it need not be limited by physical space, right? Whether we're working at home or we're working with others in other areas, you know, we've used this technology to come together and to be able to really broaden our our footprint, um, and there's some, you know, for 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 um, for uh, employees or for team members of startups, there's a big quality of life benefit because they can maybe have some flexibility about where they work. Um, and there's a there's been a realization by the investment community, and this is really important that startup teams don't necessarily need to be co-located, um, and they weren't really always before, but. Um, they typically, you know, most of them were, they would come out of a geography, um, a certain place. Um, now we're seeing teams that are formed that, you know, they're, they're, they're all over the place right now. And investors are becoming much more comfortable with that. Um, it's also increased level of access to talent for any business who's willing to embrace this model. Um, any business, even being a, a, a high potential tech startup, I can go out and find talent now. I don't have to look in Phoenix. I don't have to look in the state of Arizona. I can find folks from all around the country to join my team and uh, it becomes very powerful. So next slide. Um, so with, with, the, with the geographic dispersion of, these, um, of the talent in these startups, we're starting to see angel groups who were generally organized by a geographic region because angel, and I really didn't talk too much about this, but angel groups have, you know, traditionally been low, um, been grouped by physical locale. Like we had ATI here in Phoenix, we've got um, Desert Angels down in Tucson. So they know their local ecosystem. You know, everybody, they, they usually know the startups in the ecosystem. They know the people associated with the startups. The investors know each other. So it was a very local phenomenon. Well, now it's kind of, you're starting to see, okay, capital is starting to cross um, geographic boundaries and prox and so proximity isn't as, as important. So you're seeing angels maybe on the West Coast and uh, invest in startups, maybe that are located or based in the, on the East Coast, but have talent, you know, located all over the all over the country. So new opportunities have been created here. And it's really, really, um, it's, I think it's I mean, very, very beneficial. Um, there's some downside to this. And let's go to the next slide. You know, you're You've got increased engagement opportunities. Now I can light up a Zoom call if I got an investor on the other end, and it's a pretty easy um, way to engage, right? Uh, virtual pitching, um, did, did a lot of it over the pandemic. I think it's here to stay. Um, there is, you know, there, the downside of this, if you're doing it virtually, is there is some, we've built in, we've accumulated some Zoom fatigue and we've got shorter attention spans. I know I do. I know everybody on who's doing Zoom meetings does. Um, it, you know, you can lo easily lose your audience in the first thirty seconds if you're not prepared uh, on a Zoom pitch. Uh, and my my little slide here, uh, the picture. You know, be brief, be bright, be gone. Right. This is really important. Make sure that you've practiced your pitch. You've got a good pitch. Your pitch is second nature. Um, this the crispness. Um, is really important because if you, you know, again, if you start off and you're not prepared and the, 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 uh, the investor sees and the investors see that you're not prepared, this Zoom fatigue, this attention span, I mean, I, it, just, it just shuts right off. They just click right off. So be, be cognizant. You know, the, uh, the other side of these increased opportunities are you've got to be ultra prepared for these opportunities. Um, next slide. Okay, last section here. I'm going to grab a sip of water real quick. 
okay. Angel groups and platforms. We're going to talk about different groups, and I'm going to give you some some examples here. So next slide, please. Um, well, go go to the go to the first. Go back. I'm sorry, Eileen. I, I missed something here. So you know, we talked. You know, there are angel groups here in Arizona. I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to give you some ideas about the angel groups that are, are located in the United States, and they're all. Typically, you know, again, as these angel groups open up in the United States, they're more apt to take on um, engagements from out of their particular geographic region. So we'll talk about both. Thank you, Eileen. Next slide. So in an angel group, how are decisions made? And here we got a slide. Uh, it talks about, it shows people raising a hand. And this is exactly how decisions are made. So um, there is no group consensus mechanism. There's no fun per se. It's not everybody pools their money and then somebody decides whether the group is going to invest that pool of money. The funding is the sum of the aggregation of the individual commitment. So maybe in this particular picture, this um, uh, the person up there is uh, maybe the leader of the group and they're saying, who is interested in this in the company that just pitched us? How many people want to invest? And this is exactly the way it works. You, you raise your hand, you fill out a form, and then you move on. Those are those are your potential investors, and they work they work the process from there. So it's important that if you get in front of a group of angels, and sometimes you could have eighty in the room, and nobody, and you didn't get any investment, you know, that means nobody or very few people in that group wanted to invest. So you're really pitching 80 individuals you're not pitching a group and you're not pitching a manager a fund manager um, per se so this is important to know next slide please um and then in the groups there's a there's an application process so you know if you wanted to uh, pitch or, or get in front of um uh a, an angel group here in town you there you go through their application process and on the left I, and this is kind of comes from my background and being on the screening committee. There's the screening that goes by just because you put an application and doesn't mean you get the pitch in front of the constituency. And the constituency would be maybe the 50, 80, 20 angels that are in that particular group. So um, there's a process. You put the application in, somebody does an initial screen, you know, did they fill all the paperwork out right? Then it goes to the stage, the screening committee, right? The screening committee will be made up of maybe a handful of the angels from that group, and they'll have some a rubric or some criteria and screen you down to maybe four that are pitching, or three or two, depending on um, on you know the capacity of the group. Um, and then after you pitch, you go through it. Uh, people uh, people who raise their hands, okay, I want in. They get to go through due diligence with you. So now you now we'll get more focus groups. We'll start to ask more questions, and we'll engage um, due diligence before the you know people are comfortable. So just because you raise your hand, that means I want to invest. That means I want to go through the due diligence process. The due diligence process tells you at the end of the day, do I have enough information to invest? If you do, then the group will put the deal terms together um, and invest. Important, if you're in an angel group, if you're dealing with an angel group and you have 20 investors that come in at $25,000, you don't have 25 investors on your cap table. You typically, they, 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 there's a special uh, purpose um, company that they'll create um, among themselves. It'll be one investment that company will invest on your cap table. So that's good going down the road. Uh, you don't want a lot of people on your cap table, especially if you start to get into more sophisticated investors and especially VCs, they don't less like that. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, companies per cycle on the left, that means, uh, you know, let's say the group I was in, we ran four cycles a year, okay? And so we get 50, we get 50 applications per cycle. And we, we whittle those five down to the to three for pitching, you know, and then on the total uh, per year, if you aggregate, uh, let's say this, this says five cycles, so 250 per year would be five cycles per year. Um, you know, we maybe fund five or 10 out of 250. So you get a lot of people that are, you know, will say, hey, angels don't invest. You know, I went through, they never invest. Well, they do. 
but they just screen you down um, to um, to these uh, to lower numbers from the investment. So I, I guarantee you they do, but um, uh, you may fall out of the screen. Now with a you know if you fall out someplace, a couple of things you can always go back, um, especially if they tell you you're too early. Um, so yeah, at some point you can come back to them. It, it's not a the door is not shut forever, of course. Um, the, the other thing is they will provide feedback, take the feedback. When I was there, um, you know, um, half the people wouldn't even take the feedback. Uh, the other quarter would be just mad as hell, you know, and, and they didn't want the feedback. They just wanted to give you, they wanted their pound of flesh. Right? They just wanted to dig into you because you were wrong. Um, and then about 25% of them would, would actually, uh, would take the feedback. Feedback's important. And this, these are, this is, you know, these are seasoned investors and you should take it as a learning experience. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, it's tip, the typical, uh, angel, uh, group, uh, traditional, uh, phenomena has been a local level, but now, you know, you can, you know, we used to, uh, work, uh, with the mountain West. Well, so, you know, if, if we couldn't fill out a round, we would go to, uh, you know, maybe, uh, folks in New Mexico or Colorado or Utah, uh, there's other groups that maybe we might say, Hey, we're in, we're good for a hundred. They need 200. Can you guys fill this out? So there's some collaboration syndicating among the groups. And then now that's kind of expanded to a national footprint too. So you, you just see that trend going from local to regional to kind of national uh, as far as collaboration goes. And then cutting across the bottom is virtual platforms and verticals, right? So there are, there are, angel groups out there now who have started that aren't really tied to a geography. This is kind of a new phenomenon, but they really focus on certain verticals. Um, so again, important. I'll show you those. Next slide, please. Okay, so the local groups here, I think there are actually a couple more. Arizona Tech Investors, I mentioned then Canyon Angels run out of Grand Canyon uh, University. Uh, Desert Angels down in Tucson, Arizona Founders Fund, Arizona Disruptors.com, Golden Seeds. Anyone know Golden Seeds? They're um, they're really um, primarily focused on underserved, primarily women. Um, um, although all of every, all these groups, of course, take um, take uh, uh, applications and, and potential investment from women, or, or um, but Golden Seeds tends to focus on women. So there's, there's four or five here in Arizona. I think there's another one that just popped up. I didn't have on here. Um, next slide, please. In the Mountain West. Um, Park City Angels is out in Utah. Um, uh, Sierra Angels, I'm not sure where they are. Uh, Tech Coast Angels are on the, they're in California, I believe they're at LA, Rocky, uh, the Rockies Venture Club, there's New Mexico, they just, they're not, just a night, you, you can Google them, there's a bunch of different um, mountain, a uh, bunch of different groups here in the Mountain West that, you know, you could apply directly to potentially being, you know, here in Arizona. Uh, next slide. And here are some national, there are some groups that are dispersed, New York Angels, uh, Chicago Archangels, Charlotte, um, North Texas Angel Network. So um, again, not all of these, and this is just, again, just an example of, of the ones that are out there. Not all of them will take out-of-state engagement, but more and more of the trends we're seeing out-of-state engagement. Next slide, please. And here are some of the platforms. Okay, so uh, Chemical Angel Network, uh, they're out of Chicago. Um, they're looking across the country and anything chemical kind of related. Angel MD is a platform that um, works mostly on medical um, type of, of devices um, and other technologies, mostly uh, doctors who, um, who are the investors. E8 is out of Seattle. There are alternative energy group. There's the fashion angels. I don't, I'm not sure where they're out of. Um, there's life science angels that are primarily life science. So again, these are, these are more vertical focused and they're virtual platforms that you can apply to. Next 
slide, please. And I think I'm, I think I'm done here. So additional resources. If you're interested in studies, data, um, all kinds of things available to you. Angel Capital Association, it's a trade group. It's got a bunch of information you guys can, um, you guys can uh, uh, access at no fee. Uh, this second one, Pandemic Investor Impact Report, I would disregard that. I don't know, I think we're kind of through that already. Uh, Angel Resource Institute, Angel, is a, there's a study essentially. So here's, you know, again, when you get your slides, you can, if you want to dig into some of the data, some of the stuff that's going on and follow it, you know, this stuff is, some of this stuff is um, uh, updated every quarter or, or half a year or a year. So it's all available to you. So next slide. Well, now we're at questions. So I'm going to see, I've got, I got some, some things in the q and I got some things. Okay, I'm going to go with the Q and a uh, chat first. So, oh, Tom Fulcher, Tom, hey Lou, Arizona Founders Fund has basically been replaced with Snore and Founders Fund. Okay, fat, that they closed, and they're replaced by the Snore and Founders Fund. I'm not sure if I had that in the slide, but Tom, thank you very much. I will make that update. Okay, Pan, pa, Padma, um, she's got. Oh, he. I'm sorry. Um, a previous slide gave $100,000 as an example of investment. They said the slide won roughly 20% of the company. Does that mean you should look to have a valuation of 500K before approaching an angel investor? Uh, no, not necessarily. So, um, you, you should, you, well, maybe a minimum of 500K, probably. I mean, I, I hate to say there are minimums. But you know, typically by the time angels get involved, your your company is worth a million, million and a half on the low end, up to you know eight million on the high end. So um, you should be in 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 that ballpark per se. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the Q and A here. Oh, Cody, does it always have to be 10x? Well, it doesn't have to be anything, but I'm going to, but I am always going to screen for 10x at least uh, up to 30x. So if there is a company that I think is going to return less than 10x, um, you know, I've got, I've got folks who put business plans together that they say, well, we're just going to pay, we're going to pay them, our investors back 2x in five years. And I'm looking at their venture and their venture is risky. I'm, it, it, like there's no way that uh, an angel investor is going to really you bite on that, right? So you you know, you've got to have a story that supports 10x per se. If you're going to go to angel investors, Vanessa Campbell, is there a certain percentage of my money that I should be invested to qualify to qualify for one of these investments? Also, are investments granted towards franchises? If not, what time does small businesses qualify? Okay, second, I'm going to go to the second question first because I understand that. Typically, not. Um, franchises are, you know, franchises, you know, if you got a good franchise, I go to the bank, right? The bank, a lot less risk. Franchises rings the risk out of, out of a business, right? You don't have to start anything. You got to operate a franchise. So always good SBA financing for franchises. Um, angel investors, typically you can't get the return on a franchise. Um, but the first one is there a certain percentage of my money that I should, should, be invested to qualify for one of these investments. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, if you can clarify, please put it in the in the chat or in the Q and A. The, the you know um, of your own money. If you're starting, you know it's got to be relative proportion. So for a very wealthy individual um, starting a business, and I see this a lot. They want to use other people's money, and you put, if, you know, a wealthy individual who's got a five million dollar portfolio puts ten thousand dollars in to start a business. Um, you know what? That's just another chip. That's just another, you know, that's a, maybe a trip to Europe or something for them. Now, on the other hand, you know, I have I have a client who uh, they invested fifty thousand dollars, two partners in this technology platform, and these guys are working the. I even call it the night shift, the morning shift in Amazon on the loading docks, the, 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 the three to three to eight shift, the three to seven shift um, to sustain themselves. And, you know, so those guys putting $50,000 in those two partners, 
that means something, right, to an investor. So that's relative. So that, then that's kind of the point. Okay. Uh, what is your view of pre-revenue with IP? Do angels invest? So good, good question here. So pre-revenue, angels always invest in pre-revenue. They'd like to see you as close to revenue as possible, which means you got really good traction. Um, however, if you don't have good traction, if you don't have a proof of concept, if you don't have, haven't done discovery, if you haven't checked the boxes and you, all you have is IP um, with really no business built up around it, um, it's very difficult to get an angel investor, right? So I will tell you intellectual property is, um, well, it's difficult to get, it's not always monetizable and intellectual property, the value is created. And I have this discussion with the vendors all the time um, that uh, the value not necessarily, is not necessarily in the IP, the value is in the ability for the management team to execute and commercialize the business that's where the and that's why the management team gets paid big bucks um and that's why there's so much upside there so um that's the answer to that question let's see i got do i have one more uh a woman stephanie chung a, as a woman minority do you have recommendations for overcoming biases with current angel demographic um i i don't have anything i don't know um be good you know, if you talk to if you talk to any underserved person who's been successful in this area, they always felt like they had to be twice as good as somebody else. So, um, and, I, and that's unfortunate, and I don't necessarily agree with that. In my own personal, I don't believe I have any personal biases, biases um, um, at least that I know of. But as a woman or an, or as a minority, um, just you got to make sure if you if you feel like you're you're um, you know behind the eight ball a little bit. And it may be that cards are stacked against you. You just got to make sure you're you're ultra prepared. Um, but again, we're moving in the right direction with regard to angel groups. Um, you know, an angel group. You know, with regard to recruiting, you know, you've got to find typically people who join angel groups are comfortable in that space, right? So now they came probably came out of STEM someplace or within a STEM business or some kind of high potential business. And so it's kind of self-selecting, right? If I don't have a lot of women that were in those businesses, if I don't have a lot of underserved populations that were in those businesses, it's really hard to get them to be comfortable with this investment class, right? And a, a great example, and it has nothing to do with um, necessarily underserved, but you got real estate investors. We have tons of them here in Arizona who've made lots of money, lost lots of money. I've been here a long time. Um, it, it, it's almost impossible to get a real estate investor to take his money out of real estate, his or her money out of real estate and put him into this asset class, right? They just don't understand it. They just didn't make their money here. And so that's part of that bias. We've got to do a better job with, with making opportunities available, especially in the STEM fields. So we can have uh, folks come up through these businesses that are comfortable in this space. Okay. I think that's it. Anything else, anybody? Eileen? Um, no, I think that's it, Lou. Thank you so much for uh, today's webinar. Okay, and is there one more slide here with my information on it? Let's I see. believe so. Okay, so you'll get this information. Um, oh, there's an evaluation, I'm sorry. There's an evaluation. Um, that will come, please please fill it out. Let us know how we're doing, it's important. Um, we wanna be able to provide content to our, uh, to our, our, our clients and, and our potential clients. Um, also, if you think, you know, if you think you've got, you're in this space that you need angel investment at some point based on what was presented here, by all means, reach out to me um, through the SBDC and um, we, can, we can start a, a relationship in a session and I can, I can help you one-on-one. -on -one. So, Again, thank you, everybody, um, and um, have a great day. Thank you, Lou. Okay.